everyone. Good morning, good evening. A welcome to week six of the introduction to Buddhism. And this week we're going to be talking about non-duality. Briefly put up the outline. So we'll start with uh, a review, an introduction. We've covered much of this before, but I, I think it'll be helpful just as a foundation for what we're going to talk about today. We'll then talk uh, about how non-duality compares to some of the background of our thought and our philosophy in the modern world. And then we'll talk about non-duality in the Buddhist path, going through a view, meditation, and action, and talking a little also about the result. So, um, by non-duality means not to, and not dual, and all Buddhist paths consider themselves to be non-dual. Indeed, all Indian religions, philosophies, and spiritual paths consider themselves to be non-dual. Avoiding the extremes of dualism is considered a fundamental element of a correct path. But the way that non-duality is understood and interpreted is more refined and sophisticated in some paths than others. Now, we've talked uh, already about the way of thinking about the path in terms of view, meditation, action, and result. And any path has these elements, and they're different, of course, for each path. The result is what is the aim of the path, what we realize or obtain if we follow this path. The view is what is truth, what are our underlying assumptions and beliefs about reality that will guide us on the path, that are the foundations for our path. Meditation is about how are we going to familiarize ourselves with this view? What are the different practices that we can follow to do that? And action or conduct is how should we behave in our lives, in our work, in our relationships, if we want to stay true to this path, to this view. And as we've seen already in the past weeks in Buddhism, the result we variously call it Nirvana, Enlightenment, Buddha, Tathagata. You know, sometimes we talk about it as realizing the truth. When there is no more dirt on our window, when we're able to rest without disturbance and distraction in the cognizance or awareness that is the nature of our minds. This is the state of the Buddha. And we can contrast that with our current result, you know, the result that we experience by living our ordinary worldly samsaric lives. Yes, there are all the ups and downs, excitement and disappointment, hope and fear, pleasure and pain, success and failure. But our experience is pervaded by unsatisfactoriness and suffering. We don't feel like we're making the most of our lives. Our days get filled with petty frustrations and meaningless activities. We feel like we're going round and round in circles. You know, this is samsara. Now the view, the foundational Buddhist view, shared by all the schools. Uh, we've talked again quite a lot about the three marks of existence, anicca, impermanence, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness and suffering, and anatta, and then self. That is the truth. In Buddhism, that is the Dharma itself, both in the sense of truth and in the sense of the teachings that set out this truth. And if we realize this truth and internalize it so that it is present for us every moment, then we are awakened. But if we have wrong views, then we end up creating and then clinging to a solid and permanent self that we want to nurture and protect. And this gives rise to craving and then negative emotions and actions. And then we're back to our ordinary world or experience that we call samsara with pleasure and pain and all the rest. Now meditation, again, we've talked about this, the different paths of Buddhism collectively offer a vast diversity of different forms of practice and meditation, different skillful means to familiarize ourselves with the view and to cultivate the three trainings. We've talked about shila, you know, ethical discipline, including training ourselves in compassion, samadhi, meditative concentration, mindfulness, non-distraction, and prajna, wisdom or discriminative awareness. And in modern psychology, we would call these deliberate practices or intentional practices. And our practice will often progress more rapidly with the support and feedback from a community of fellow practitioners. Again, in modern psychology, we call that a community of practice or an intentional community. In Buddhism, this is the Sangha. 
In previous weeks, we've introduced shamatha and talked in some detail about vipassana. And these practices are foundational to all the Buddhist paths in the three vehicles or the three yanas, you know, the Shravakayana, the Mahayana, the Vajrayana, in the sense that all of the Buddhist practices will include shamatha, the cultivation of the ability to be present, non-distracted, aware of what is going on right now, uh, and also vipassana, cultivating the ability to see not just surface appearances, but the truth, the truth of self, others, and phenomena, their nature, the nature of anicca, dukkha, anatta. And we've introduced these practices as they were presented in the Pali suttas, and as they were practiced and continued to be practiced in the Shravakayana, the Theravada path. There have subsequently been many other paths in Buddhism, of course, including the Bodhisattva path and Mahayana Buddhism, the Four Immeasurables, the Six Paramitas, and so forth and the vast and diverse set of practices of Vajrayana Buddhism, you know, Tibetan Buddhism. And of course, as with all phenomena, Buddhism itself is marked by the characteristic of anicca or impermanence, growth, change. You know, the underlying truth of the Dharma, the underlying goal of awakening to the state of the Buddha has not changed. But much like our modern world, is pervaded by technological innovation founded on the work of scientists and entrepreneurs. There has been tremendous innovation in the technologies of Buddhism, you know, the practices, the methods, the paths. And there are now so many different authentic ways we can approach Buddhism. We're at a unique point in the history and development of Buddhism that they're all available and coming to the modern world together. And this course gives rise to complexity and perhaps confusion and misunderstanding but there is an incredible richness and opportunity there as well if we can learn to see it um, we so the next action and conduct uh, we haven't talked as much about action and conduct uh, thanks by the way everyone's commenting it's quiet let me see if i can do anything about that um, i hope that uh, is this any better? I don't know. I'm sorry. Um, we haven't talked about action and conduct. Um, we're going to cover it in the final two weeks. But we have already observed that in Buddhism, we accept widely different lifestyles. You know, from renunciants and monastics, the simple life of a monk or a nun in a monastery, uh, householders of all kinds, from great bodhisattvas and saints, kings and queens and warlords, to ordinary families living ordinary lives. And then the great Mahasiddhas and wanderers. We've talked about figures like the Saraha, Naropa, Tilopa, the arrow-making Dakini, the half-prostitute, half-time arrow-maker, who is Saraha's teacher. People who live their lives free from constraints of worldly and societal norms. Right? So we've, we've covered all of this. I just want to come back now to say, well, what if we were really looking at all of this again from a non-dual uh, perspective, how might we approach this framework of view, meditation, action, and result? Well, the result is the same, right? We would seek to awaken to the state of the Buddha, to realize the truth. Uh, the view, of course, would be non-duality. And this is based on anatta, or non-self, one of those three marks we have already talked about. But it does get extended in some subtle and important ways. Uh, in the basic uh, forms of Buddhism, we establish the selflessness or the emptiness of the person, but not necessarily the selflessness or the emptiness of all phenomena. The earliest Buddhist schools still believed that external objects and mental representations were real. Uh, but in the non-dual view of the Madhyamaka, neither reflexive awareness, nor internal cognitive aspects, nor external objects can be established in any way as possessing intrinsic characteristics. All dharmas lack intrinsic existence. Emptiness applies not just to the self, but to all phenomena, including the Buddha's path, even the state of the Buddha, enlightenment itself. And, you know, lest we conclude that enlightenment, sorry, emptiness must itself be the ultimate truth, 
Nagarjuna demonstrates it in his uh, Ramadhyamaka Karaka that emptiness is also emptiness. And this, is, this is obviously a very big topic, but for our present purposes, we can say the ultimate truth in Buddhism is that there is no ultimate truth to be found. Right? The so-called right view is the understanding that all views are wrong views. And in particular, we can speak of the wrong views of eternalism and nihilism which are the two basic ways we can go wrong, right? the two sides that we can fall from the middle way. Now, in meditation, as we've explored in previous weeks, we can bring the non-dual view to any and all methods of meditation. We can familiarize ourselves with the view through basic satipatthana practice, mindfulness of our breathing, or in any of the Mahayana or Vajrayana practices. All practices are acceptable. Um, however, we can also familiarize ourselves with the non-dual view without engaging in any specific behaviors. Now, we've talked about this in a couple of ways. We've talked about knowing the cognizance, the observer. And we've also talked about it as knowing whatever is happening right now. Now, we can practice this in any practice that we are following. And even if we're not specifically or intentionally practicing, you could be, I would encourage you, to do this right now as you are listening to this. Just know whatever is happening for you right now. Now in terms of action, we use terms like spontaneous action, uncontrived, unfabricated, but we haven't yet talked about this, uh, what it might mean in practice. But put simply, if we are able to maintain the view in all that we do, um, then all of our action becomes non-dual action. All lifestyles are acceptable. Right? The path, the non-dual path, is very inclusive. Of course, feminism, racial equity, yes, yes, but so much more than this. Now, Non-dual view, of course, involves going beyond everyday dualities like left and right, one or many, up or down, before or after, good or bad. And even this is already a challenge to our logical and rational way of engaging with the world. And as we'll see in a, in a moment, our way of working with the world in modernity, our underlying assumptions are very much based on duality. But in religious and spiritual traditions, non-duality also means or refers to non-dual awareness. It's also known as primordial consciousness or witness consciousness, sometimes primordial natural awareness, which is described as the essence of being, right? sometimes centerless without dichotomies. And Indian ideas of non-dual awareness developed as uh, Proto-Sankhya speculations in pre-Buddhist India in the first millennium BCE with the notion of Purusha, right, which was seen as a witness consciousness or pure consciousness. And in the Indian traditions, the realization of this primordial consciousness, witnessing but disengaged from the entanglements of ordinary mind and samsara, is considered moksha, right, release from suffering and samsara. And that's what's realized through practicing the path. And these early ideas of primordial awareness thoroughly influenced both Hindu traditions, such as yoga, Advaita Vedanta, and Kashmiri Shaivism, as well as Buddhism, which all emerged in close interaction. They all developed philosophical systems to describe the relation between this essence and mundane samsaric reality. Um, so we can find descriptions of non-dual consciousness in Hinduism with words like Purusha, Turiya, Sahaja, and in Buddhism, terms like luminous mind, emptiness, Parinispanna, nature of mind, Rigpa. But there are important differences between them. So it's important to realize when we're hearing unfamiliar words like non-dual awareness or primordial awareness, that these can mean very different things in different traditions. And we should, certainly shouldn't assume that our 
everyday understanding of these words is the same as the Buddhist understanding. And this is particularly important now that uh, teachings like Dzogchen and Mahamudra are available on Amazon. It's very easy to misunderstand these profound Buddhist teachings and practices. So I do want to talk a little more about the view. Right? We've, we've already said in previous weeks the view is foundational because the very purpose of our meditation is to familiarize ourselves with the right view, the viewless view of the middle way. And our action is only right action when it is informed by the right view. Arushi said when he was teaching Madhyamaka in 1996, he said, you know, view is key to the authentic transmission of Dharma in the West. He said, in Buddhism, the view is essential for both theory and practice. All the various Buddhist schools and paths have been established based on the right view, and the result of the Buddhist path, enlightenment, is none other than the complete understanding or realization of the view. The view is indispensable for all kinds of Buddhist practice, from the simple and seemingly mundane acts of a Theravadan monk shaving his head and not eating after midday, to the Mahayana practitioner abandoning meat, offering butter lamps and circumambulating, to the more complicated and exotic paths such as building monasteries or practicing Kundalini Yoga. The view not only gives us the reason to practice, it is also the result we seek to attain through practice. Furthermore, the view is also a safety railing that prevents us from going astray on the path. Without the view, the whole aim and purpose of Buddhism is lost. And now that Buddhism is taking root in the West, I feel it's important for at least some of us to pay attention to the study of the view and how it is to be established. Unfortunately, our human tendency is to be much more attracted to the methods of doing something rather than why we are doing it. The study of the view appears to be very dry, boring and long-winded, whereas anyone can just buy a cushion, sit on it and after a few minutes feel satisfied that they have sat and meditated. But without the view, the whole purpose of Buddhism is lost. It is then no longer Buddhism, a path to enlightenment, but merely a method for temporal healing. So even for the sake of insurance, at least some of us should pay some attention to establishing the view. Yeah, so I do want to talk a little bit about this. Um, I mean, much of Madhyamaka is about how the idea of non-duality is to be correctly understood. And later Buddhist schools critiqued the ideas of non-Buddhists, of course, but even the earlier Buddhist philosophical schools. And it's a little like a doctor having a wrong view about what's causing an illness. If you have an incorrect diagnosis, that's going to lead to an incorrect course of treatment, which would mean the illness would not be cured and the patient would not be healed. Now, so in philosophy, just as in medicine, we need our view to be correct. And so as Rinpoche said, sometimes people think the study of Madhyamaka is dry and boring and academic. We get more excited about meditation and compassion. But without the right view, our whole path becomes as useless as trying to treat a disease with the wrong medicine. Now, sometimes this language of non-duality can feel very abstract, especially if we haven't had the opportunity yet to familiarize ourselves much with the non-dual view through our practice. We can easily misunderstand it. And it may not yet be clear why this view is different from the view we have in our ordinary lives. And part of the challenge of understanding a non-dual view, is that we're doing it from within a language and within a culture that is very dualistic. And we may not even realize the extent to which is the case. So I want to look a little at some of the foundational ideas that underpin Western thought, including our ethics and rationality, and therefore our economic and political systems such as capitalism and democracy. And even though, of course, we have non-Western traditions alive and well in the world, the influence of globalization, especially global capitalism, is such that these Western ideas have now spread throughout the world. And many CEOs, leaders, practical men and women might not describe their political or leadership principles in terms of this philosophy, this background to Western thought, but it's there nevertheless. And it's also very important for us to understand this as Buddhist practitioners. Of course, especially if we come from Western countries and cultures where this is the default view, but 
as we just said, the, these ideas are now to be found everywhere in the world, in the modern globalized world, even in countries that would not consider themselves Western. So if we don't understand how our view has this background, we can easily distort our understanding of Buddhism. Now, we might inadvertently turn the non-dual path into something dualistic, which would not only affect our approach to ethics and behavior in the world, but also our meditation practice, our understanding of self, mind, and this awareness or cognizance we've been talking about. So I want to talk a little about some of these backgrounds or foundations to uh, Western thought. So let's start with ethics, uh, or in this case, the Abrahamic religious traditions. Right, Western morality and ethics are about asking and answering the question about what is right and wrong behavior. And this is based in the West on the teachings of the three main Abrahamic religions, right? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And they all accept the tradition that God revealed himself to the patriarch Abraham. They're all monotheistic. They all conceive of God as a transcendent creator and also as the source of moral law. The individual, God and the universe are highly separate from one another. The Abrahamic religions believe in a judging, paternal, fully external God to which the individual and nature are subordinate. You know, one seeks salvation and transcendence not by contemplating the natural world or their philosophical speculation, but by seeking to please God, such as obedience with God's wishes or his law. And they see divine revelation as outside self or nature or custom. So all three are clearly dualistic. God is quite separate from the individual. Heaven is quite separate from hell. Good is very different from bad. Right is very different from wrong. One either obeys God's wishes and his law, or one doesn't. As is perhaps most famously told in the Christian story of Adam and Eve, and the doctrines then of the fall of man and original sin. These are important beliefs in Christianity, although perhaps not so much in Judaism and Islam. Adam and Eve were the first man and woman, and they're central to the Christian belief that humanity is in essence a single family with everyone descended from a single pair of original ancestors. And in the book of Genesis of the Hebrew Bible, in the first five chapters, there are two creation narratives with two distinct perspectives. In the first, Adam and Eve are not named. Instead, God created human kind in God's image and instructed them to multiply and be stewards over everything that God had made. In the second narrative, however, God fashions Adam from dust and places him in the Garden of Eden. Adam is told he can eat freely of all the trees in the garden, except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Subsequently, Eve is created from one of Adam's ribs to be his companion. They are innocent and unembarrassed about their nakedness. However, a serpent convinces Eve to eat from fruit from the forbidden tree, and she gives some of the fruit to Adam. And these acts give them additional knowledge. Uh, it gives them the ability to conjure negative and destructive concepts such as shame and evil. God later curses the serpent and the ground. He prophetically tells the woman and the man what will be the consequences of their sin of disobeying God, and then he banishes them from the Garden of Eden. I'm not going to attempt to cover 2,000 years of commentary on this ancient story, um, but suffice it to say that we have ended up with a Christian doctrine of original sin, namely that humans inherited a tainted nature and a proclivity to sin through the fact of birth. But this is not a belief shared by Buddhism. Right? There is no concept of original sin or evil in Buddhism. Buddhist ethics are founded on the idea that the root cause of people saying and doing harmful things is not a sinful disposition, but ignorance and wrong views. Now, in Buddhism, as we saw in week two, you are your own master. The solution, therefore, is to overcome ignorance through establishing and familiarizing yourself with the right view. As the Buddha said, I can only show you the way. You have to do your own work. Whereas in Christianity, only God can forgive, and atonement, 
which refers to the forgiving and pardoning of sin in general and original sin in particular, happens through the suffering, death and resurrection of Jesus. Now the influence of Abrahamic concepts of good and evil on Western thought, ethics, politics, legal systems, society is profound, right? nearly ubiquitous, and we don't see it. Right? Remember David Foster Wallace's story, This is Water. The fish don't necessarily know they're swimming in the water. And also remember John Maynard Keynes, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Or perhaps we could add they're slaves to some prophet or theologian. Yeah, so for Western Buddhists in particular, many have come from families or cultures that were originally Christian. And so this influence of Christianity is probably going to be there. And if nothing else, it's there in the very structure of Western language. And our words, and the way we form concepts, they come with all these connotations, these semantic relationships that link back to these underlying dualities. And as Rupert said, even in Buddhist countries like Bhutan, a lot of the school system now was put in place by Christian missionaries so even young Bhutanese people, when they're growing up with ideas of ethics and morality, those are in many cases more Christian than Buddhist. So just as a reflection, I think it's very important for us just to pause and think, wow, how many of our ideas of good and bad, of right and wrong, are based on some underlying dualistic system, right? which in turn is based on some Abrahamic understanding. Because I think very often people ask questions about Buddhism coming from this sort of ethical framework, and it really is quite different. Right? Rupesha says people often ask questions about, you know, do Buddhists think it's right or wrong to eat meat or to drink alcohol or things like that? And I think a lot of those questions they, they, they come from this kind of ethical frame. And it's just a very, very different way of thinking from the Buddhist way. So we'll come back to that. Okay, a second major area uh, of difference, and a major area of sort of foundation to Western thinking, is logic and rationality. And in particular, there's something called the three laws of thought. Right? These are fundamental Kind of foundations of philosophy, so axiomatic rules upon which rational discourse itself is uh, based. And these have a long tradition in the history of philosophy and logic, going back certainly as far as ancient Greek philosophy. And generally they're taken as laws that guide and underlie all thought, all expression, all discussion in the Western world, and now of course the modern globalized world. So here are the three laws. First, the law of identity. Second, the law of non-contradiction. Third, the law of excluded middle. So I'm going to talk about them using the words of Bertrand Russell. So the law of identity, he says, whatever is, is. So here Aristotle wrote, first then, this at least is obviously true, that the word be or not be has a definite meaning so that not everything will be so and not so. Again, if man has one meaning, let this be two-footed animal. And by having one meaning, I understand this. If man means X, then if A is a man, X will be what being a man means for him. Yeah, so it's very basic. It's just saying we need to be able to have fixed ideas of identity to be able to use thought or language at all. Because if this law does not hold, words and language will collapse. There'll be no stable system of representation, no stable system of meaning. What we refer to, if it changes from one moment to the next, we'll no longer be able to talk or think about anything. Right? Thought and language would become completely impossible. So I think sometimes we don't even realize the extent to which this is foundational for us, but just this idea of identity. Okay, second law, the law of non-contradiction. Nothing can both be and not be. In other words, two or more contradictory statements cannot 
both be true in the same sense at the same time. So Aristotle said, one cannot say of something that it is and that it is not in the same respect and at the same time. So he said, it is impossible then that being a man should mean precisely not being a man. If man not only signifies something about one subject, but also has one significance, and it will not be possible to be and not to be the same thing, except in virtue of ambiguity, just as if one whom we call man and others were to call not man. But the point in question is not this, whether the same thing can at the same time be and not be a man in name, but whether it can be in fact. Okay? So this is why contradiction is such a big problem in Western thought, so much centre in Western logic. And as Aristotle points out, it's not about whether we're choosing to use the same names for something, but about whether we're referring to the same underlying reality. In other words, the same facts about the world. And as we've seen in contemporary politics and the rise of fake news, this is what you, know, you see once agreement on a shared reality starts to break down. You know, any hope of rational discourse falls apart. Okay, the third law is the law of excluded middle. Everything must either be or not be. So here Aristotle said, on the other hand, there cannot be an intermediate between contradictories. But of one subject, we must either affirm or deny any one predicate. This is clear in the first place if we define what the true and false are. To say of what is that it is not, or what is not that it is, is false. While to say of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not, is true. So that he who says of anything that it is, or that it is not, will either say what is true or what is false. Yeah, so this is kind of very foundational to logic. In other words, you know, if there are two opposed and contradictory alternatives, we have to choose one or the other. We'll take an everyday example. If someone were to ask, will you marry me? You might be unsure, you might need more time to consider your answer, but there are only two answers. And likewise, if a doctor were to examine an injured person, he might ask, is this person dead or alive? Again, there are only two answers. And according to the law of excluded middle, this must always be the case for any coherent, rational conversation. Now, of course, we can think of examples where this does not apply. For example, if somebody were to say, are you happy or sad? The answer is often going to be something in between, or a complex mix of positive and negative emotions. But this doesn't disprove the law of excluded middle. Rather, it shows that the choices in question are not clearly defined. We could also say that we're asking the wrong question. We're trying to impose a dualistic yes or no choice on concepts that are much more complicated. And again, as Buddhists, we're going to run into quite some problems with this third law, because instead of excluding the middle, we embrace the middle, right? Our very path is the middle way. So again, just as context, right? This is very foundational to Western logic, very Western rationality, Western thought, and now global modern thought. So if we're going to engage in the non-dual path, we're going to be coming up against some fundamental contradictions, um, and we may not be fully aware of this. Writing at the end of the 19th century, the philosopher James Welton, he wrote, the laws of thought are those fundamental, necessary, formal, and a priori mental laws in agreement with which all valid thought must be carried on. And he said they're necessary because no one ever does or can conceive them reversed or really violate them because nobody ever accepts a contradiction which presents itself to his mind as such. And Buddhism is going to present us with a lot of contradictions. Now, in contemporary philosophy, there are developments that challenge classic dualistic logic such as intuitionistic logic, dialetheism, fuzzy logic, and now with the rapid emergence of artificial intelligence, we're grappling with new ways of thinking about rationality, decision-making, a representation of knowledge. And personally, I have a suspicion that the rise of artificial intelligence is going to lead to 
a significant challenge to the three laws of thought, and it's going to result in the emergence of a non-dual way of thinking in the West. Much like at the end of the 19th century, classical physics was challenged and then extended and superseded by quantum physics and relativity. Now, of course, classical physics is still useful for solving many everyday problems, and we shouldn't expect that everyday language, logic, and rationality will suddenly become useless, far from it. But my suspicion is that in the same way that physicists now realize they can't explore the far reaches of the universe or the interior of the atom using the tools and language of classical physics, I predict that pretty soon, sometime in the next couple of decades, we're going to come to see that we cannot rely solely on the dualistic foundations of modern thought. Now, as a Buddhist, I find that very encouraging because once non-duality becomes more prevalent, more commonplace, I think there's going to be much more interest in non-dual systems of thought and practice, especially the middle way of Buddhism. And I think that's going to result in quite some renaissance of the middle way. So perhaps if we were to meet again in you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years, things will be quite different. You know, let's see. I'm going to make a bold prediction. Let's see how accurate I am. Um, okay. So turning to the Buddhist path, Again, view, meditation, action, result. The view, how we see the world, the reality of self, others, the world itself. What is the truth that we're establishing? The nature of self. Meditation, how we're going to familiarize ourselves with this view so that it becomes internalized and embodied. Action, how to conduct our activities in the world. And the result, the state of awakening, enlightenment, liberation. Now, it's, it's said there are 84,000 paths in Buddhism, and all lead to awakening. But as humans, we love hierarchies. Right? We want to know what is good and bad, what is high and low. We want the best, the highest, the fastest, the easiest, the most powerful. If we were able to buy spiritual paths online, we probably also want the one with the best price. But actually, um, if we're talking about a higher path in Buddhism, Really, we would talk about the extent to which it is dualistic as opposed to non-dual. And ironically, the highest path is the one that cares the least about the distinctions of high and low. Um, Rinpoche talks about poison as medicine, right? The idea that the closer the problem is to the solution, the more non-dual or the higher the path. The greater the separation, the more dualistic, then the path has much more contrast, it's much easier to understand and to follow, and we might term it a lower path. Doesn't mean it's less effective, doesn't mean it leads us anywhere different, so higher and lower shouldn't be understood in that sense. And in fact, um, the non-dual path might superficially look easier because there's seemingly less to do but unless you have very great ability, the challenge is you might just end up practicing your ordinary samsaric ways of thinking and ways of being in the world. So if we think about the highest or the best path, really it's very individual. Right? The best is what is most beneficial to you. It's the best medicine to treat your own individual sickness. And as we progress along the path, what is best for us will change, which is part of the reason especially in Tibetan Buddhism, the path is taught as a graduated path. So, you know, 84,000 teachings, and it's like a surfer, right? As a beginning surfer, we want to learn with relatively small waves, because if we try and take on a big wave, it's just going to knock us straight off our board. Right? But for an expert surfer, big waves are not just fun, they're also necessary to provide the challenge for us to continue to progress with our path, with our development, with our growth. And this is something general we'll see, not just in Buddhism, but throughout coaching, throughout human development. We need the right balance of challenge and support. And we need a middle way, a middle path. And it's no different in Buddhism. So yes, maybe just 
knowing what's happening right now is the easiest thing to do in the world. As we said in previous weeks, we have this cognizance. We're knowing things all the time anyway. So what is happening for you right now? So just knowing this is so hard because it's so easy to get caught almost immediately in thoughts, narratives that take us away to the next thing and our awareness is left behind. So we might perhaps notice a sound, but instead of just knowing it, we start some kind of narrative. Oh, that sound is the wind picking up. Maybe a storm is coming. Oh, I should remember to close the windows. We no longer know what's happening as it is happening. We're caught in the thoughts rather than knowing the thoughts. And so this easiest practice is actually the hardest. 30 minutes can go by, you can be sitting on your cushion, but you didn't practice for more than a split second. Your mind was wandering, you didn't even know it. That doesn't mean we can't do this, of course we can, but we do need to practice. And unless you're a practitioner of very particular ability, your teacher will probably want to supplement these practices with something else, right? something more solid, something more dualistic. So not because these practices are worse or lower, but because we're still beginning as surfers, right? We still need something that we can learn to practice with. So in his book, Poison is Medicine, Rinpoche said, he said, the Vajrayana is the best thing that ever happened on this planet. Not only does it train us to think outside samsara's box, it shows us how to be inside and outside the box at the same time. And although the tumultuous ocean of jealousy, anger, pride, doubt, greed, and delusion that fills our minds can feel extremely daunting, the Vajrayana tells us that it needn't be. The antidote to all that poison is not outside us, but within. We already have exactly the right dose. Not a single drop is missing. Nothing needs improving, upgrading, customizing, or adapting. Our innate wisdom is the antidote we seek. It is perfectly intact and available for immediate use, as it always has been. Is this idea too hard for you to chew? If it isn't, why not have a go at tracking down your own innate wisdom? How? By following wisdom's footprints, which are your emotions. The essence of the Vajrayana's message is that poison is medicine just as it is, with nothing added and nothing taken away. I hope and pray that none of you ever lose your enthusiasm and in curiosity about this glorious, brilliant, and incomparable path. Yeah, so very much, yeah, Vajrayana is the non-dual path. It does start with that as the basis for the practice. Um, but it's not easy, right? Hence, the poison is the medicine. Um, not just in the sense that we use the emotions as a way of healing the sickness, so we use the, the poison itself as medicine, but if we're not careful, the medicine also can become a poison, right? We can think we're treating and healing ourselves, but all we're doing is just continuing with our everyday way of being in the world. And I, I, it does go back to this point about the foundations of Western thought. Right? Remember she said, you know, for centuries, Christian missionaries travel to the East to spread the gospel and convert the natives. Asians never had to seek out the Christian teachings, but for Westerners, it was the other way around. I've heard some very touching stories about the higgledy-piggledy roots Buddhism took to the UK, America, and Europe, especially about the hippies who followed the Beatles to India 
accidentally bumped into Buddhism, tuned into transcendental meditation and took up yoga. But few of those who took an interest in Buddhism at that time were specifically seeking enlightenment, and so they did almost no research or fact-checking, all of which made Buddhadharma's centuries-long journey to the West haphazard at best. Yet, in spite of its chaotic introduction, the results of having the Buddhist teachings in Europe, America and Australia have generally been good. The only real drawback is that quite a number of new Buddhists have been left with some quite hard-to-shake misconceptions and deeply rooted habitual patterns. Right, so, we talked about the highest view, just knowing the cognizance. And Dujan Rinpoche, Rinpoche's grandfather, said, let this life be spent in the state of uninhibited naked ease. Literally, we can laze around all day and do nothing. It's only the being our intention, our attitude, and yet that alone could be perfect practice. Now, of course that sounds very attractive. Right? Who doesn't want to think they can lie in a hammock and have a cocktail and do their practice? But how many of us can actually do that? Right? How many of us can lie in a hammock and drink a cocktail and actually stay with what is happening right now? Of course if we can, it's wonderful, right? That can be our practice. But for many of us, it is, as Rinpoche talks, like the, the charnel ground in the forest glade. Right? We've talked previous weeks about how, for many of us, it's much safer, much better, as the Buddha said, to take ourselves out of the distraction, the noise, the confusion, the complexity of our busy lives and find a space of peace, silence, whether it's going to an actual forest glade or creating these moments of forest glade in our lives, secluding ourselves, retreating ourselves, whether it's to a space in our homes, maybe going on a retreat, maybe even just turning off our phones and giving ourselves a few moments of time just for ourselves. And oddly, this hardest environment, you know, the ones with the greatest of constraint and conformity may actually be the easiest for our practice. Because while the highest might be to practice in a channel, break, channel ground with all this confusion and noise and distraction, yes, that's wonderful if we can practice there. But if we can't, it's not going to help us at all. So more constraints are better. Yeah? Retreat boundaries, shrine rooms, mountain hermitages. And also we've talked already about um, some of these widespread misconceptions that Rinpoche mentioned, namely, what is vipassana? We've talked about how actually the practice of vipassana is seeing the truth. It doesn't even need to be sitting. Yeah, you could be doing vipassana while chopping onions or arranging flowers. It doesn't even need to be something meditative. It could be reading a book with the aim to deconstruct wrong views. Whereas in the West, as we've seen, it's become about calm, stillness, presence, relieving our stress and anxiety. Indeed, it's become little more than shamatha or calm abiding. And the aim is no longer about seeing the truth. It's much more about managing our minds, about less stress, less anxiety, less depression, more self-compassion, more positive emotions, increasing our ability to be focused, all of which so that we can be happier and more successful in our worldly endeavors. None of this is bad, right? far from it. I mean, Buddhism welcomes this, it does by no means want us to be stressed or unhappy or unsuccessful. It's just that none of these things are the aim of the Buddhist path. Now the problem for a new Buddhist might be that they genuinely want to learn more about Buddhism. They might follow a Vipassana course or download a meditation app and think this is it. And I think part of the problem is that in the modern world, we're very used to judging or classifying an activity by what people are doing rather than their state of being, right? their intention, their attitude, their state of mind, while they're doing whatever it is they're doing. And we'll talk about this more next week. So for example, you could have two people sitting beside each other, both in perfect meditation posture, 
And the other, you know, could be mindfully watching the breath and contemplating impermanence, while the one sitting next to him could be fantasizing about stock portfolios, how they're going to make more money, etc. And we might look at them and conclude they're both practicing meditation. We have no idea. Especially if we are seeing them both beside each other in a Buddhist retreat center. They're both carrying malas, you know, Buddhist books beside them. Maybe they've got a picture of the Dalai Lama as the wallpaper on their phone. Right? We might even have experienced something like this in our own practice. So as we think about non-duality, uh, so much of it, part of what makes it hard is that it isn't necessarily going to be visible in our behaviors at all. It is so much in our view, in our intention, in our attitude. Uh, I just want to give a couple of uh, Zen stories. So I think the Zen tradition very much uh, loves and reveres non-duality also. And these stories uh, are wonderful, you know, like all Zen koans, as a way of challenging our ordinary dualistic thinking and perhaps shaking us a little bit out of the sleep of our habitual way of understanding the world. So the first one from the book The Gateless Gate, number 26, it's called Two Monks Roll Up the Screen. So Hogan of Serio Monastery was about to lecture before dinner when he noticed that the bamboo screen lowered for meditation had not been rolled up. He pointed to it. Two monks arose from the audience and rolled it up. Hogan, observing the physical moment, said, The state of the first monk is good, not that of the other. And the second story is also from the Gateless Gate, number 11, called Joshu Examines a Monk in Meditation. The Joshu went to a place where a monk had retired to meditate and asked him, What is, is what? The monk raised his fist. Joshu replied, Ships cannot remain where the water is too shallow. And he left. A few days later, Joshua went again to visit the monk and asked the same question. The monk answered the same way. Joshua said, Well given, well taken, well killed, well saved. And he bowed to the monk. Yeah, so as you can see, non-duality is far from our ordinary way of proceeding in the world. Okay, so with that, uh, let's take our 10 minute break and I will see you back here in 10 minutes.
hi, welcome back from the break. Um, I I don't know quite what's up with um, with the sound. Um, should we see if I can add some more sound? Um, so, yeah, so I, I, again, I apologize for the sound. I don't know what the technical problem is. Um, so I apologize, you've had to cover your own feet with leather. I'm doing my best to try and add more my side. Um, so returning to our topic, we've said the view in Buddhism is non-dual, right? But that's not uh, necessarily the way it's uh, presented to beginners. Right, Rumshe told uh, the story of a professor with a stuffed teddy bear. Right, he said how um, if there's a professor working, walking with a small child by the edge of a cliff and the child risks falling from the cliff, he's not going to give some high level lecture about gravity and so forth, he's going to entice the child away from the edge of the cliff with a stuffed teddy bear, right? So his interest at that point is one of helping, right? Skillful means, not necessarily in the truth of the correct view, right? He doesn't obviously want to do something that's incorrect or unhelpful, but I think we, we should take that same attitude to our understanding of the teachings. And the Buddha taught the truth very directly in certain teachings, in a very raw and unvarnished way. But it's hard for many of us to understand this and put it into practice in its raw state. And so, out of his great compassion, he taught the truth in many other ways also. Um, and those, you know, so there's something suitable for practitioners at any stage of their journey. And as we said, in the lower views, samsara is seen as very different from nirvana. Good is seen as different from bad. There are clear contrasts and distinctions. And it's much easier to understand. And it's essential for us when we're beginners. Because when we're first learning a new vocabulary, a new set of concepts, we can't yet distinguish subtle differences. It's like a child first learning language or first learning a subject at school. Right? We're just trying to build a basic map of the territory. A higher view is more non-dual, fewer distinctions, right? And Rumshi expresses the view very simply and beautifully when he says, it's there and it's not there. Um, so that, that's actually a very high way of saying it, and we'll come back to try and unpack that. Um, and you can immediately see that goes against the three laws of thought we were talking about just before the break. Yeah, there's paradox, there's seeming contradiction. It seems quite illogical according to Western laws of thought. And, and I want to turn to the Heart Sutra, which is said to be the single most commonly recited, copied and studied scripture in East Asian Buddhism. And I'm going to read it, but I, I encourage you to listen to the words, right? What does it actually mean? All right, so... Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagriya at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination. And at the same time, noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, while practicing the profound Prajnaparamita, saw in this way, he saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Right, as you recall, that's the various elements of the self. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita? Addressed in this way, noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way, seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature, 
Form is emptiness. Emptiness also is form. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye dhatu up to no mind dhatu, no dhatu of dharmas, no mind consciousness dhatu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times, by means of Prajnaparamita, fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajnaparamita, the great mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth, since there is no deception. The Prajnaparamita mantra is said in this way, Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisvaha. Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised Noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, thus it is, O son of noble family, thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. And when the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Yeah, so that's the core of the Heart Sutra. And for many of us, if you've come across this before, maybe it'll be very familiar. Maybe even it'll feel like an old friend. Let's just pause and look at the words for a moment, right? There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Now, for most of us, that's very far from our current experience of reality. I mean, there is birth and cessation with every moment of thought and emotion as our minds keep drifting. And most certainly, our experience of the world can differentiate characteristics of good and bad, right and wrong, profit and loss, pure and impure. We couldn't even make it through a single day without these distinctions. We couldn't even make it through breakfast. If there were no characteristics, how would we know to eat the food on our plate rather than the plate itself, or our fork, or our chopsticks? How would we even know to look for food in the fridge rather than in the garbage? You see the point. Dualistic distinctions are what enable us to navigate our world. And if you've ever spent time with a baby, you realize that it's very important for babies to learn distinctions to survive. Fire will burn, a sharp knife will cut, an aggressive dog can bite you. Yes, eventually we're going to have to undo all these dualistic distinctions once we start to practice the Mahayana path, right, the Heart Sutra. But if we don't teach these things to our children, we're very negligent parents, and our babies won't end up becoming adults. Yeah. Okay, no ignorance, no end of ignorance, up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. So here we have a total deconstruction of the path and even the result. And you would be forgiven for asking, why would I bother to follow this path? Right? Why on earth? Follow a path where it says there is no end of ignorance, no cessation of suffering, and no attainment. And what kind of path is this? It said there's not even a goal that's going to come from following this path. So, I mean, Karl uh, Brunhansel, he, 
he translated the Heart Sutra and wrote a commentary, and he gave his book the title The Heart Attack Sutra. There are accounts in several of the larger Aprajna Paramita Sutras about people being present in the audience who had already attained certain advanced levels of spiritual development or insight that liberated them from samsaric existence and suffering, and are called arhats in Buddhism. And they were listening to the Buddha and this conversation, and they had different reactions, right? Some thought, wow, this is crazy, let's go. But others stayed, and some of them had heart attacks, vomited blood, and died. It seems they did not leave in time. These arhats, these advanced practitioners, were so shocked by what they were hearing that they died on the spot. Arimshay commented on this story, and he said, you know, petty minded people like us might use these stories to boost our ego because, you know, here we are following the Mahayana, chanting the Heart Sutra. But this would be a grave mistake, right? This story actually praises these Arhats. Their shock means at least they understood something, whereas we are so dumb that it does not even touch us. And so I think that's really important. Yeah, We can hear these words, but they can bounce right off us and not penetrate us at all. When he was teaching Madhyamaka, Arimshe, going through the commentary, because it actually says in Chandrakirti's text, the Madhyamaka Vatara, starting in verse 4 of chapter 6, he talks about, well, who, who should we teach uh, this non-dual view? And there are three kinds of people that we, we should consider. The first is someone who already has an established philosophy, such as Hinduism or Buddhism. Um, it's much easier, as Rinpoche said, to teach a hardline Muslim or Christian because at least they have a view and we can debate them. Whereas it's very difficult to teach somebody new age because they are like honey. They paste things from here and there. We don't know what they're talking about, where we should try and direct our arguments. So, but if we've got a person with philosophy, we will teach them Madhyamaka with all of the arguments and we will aim to defeat their wrong views and set them up with the right view, which they can then practice. Okay, the second kind of person is a person who's completely new, right, with no philosophical background. I mean, Jeremy Chen Wangpu says such a person does have to have one quality, namely shame and embarrassment. Rinpoche says, you know, we'll find this easily. As long as a person has ego, they have shame and embarrassment. Now, for someone like this, with no religious or philosophical background, we begin with mind training. Right? We teach them things like the faults of samsara, the effects of karma, the preciousness of a human body, shamatha meditation, the different meditations on bodhicitta. We teach a gradual path, and only then do we introduce the Madhyamaka. Because according to the Mahayana Sutras, if a person does not have a good foundation of mind training and practice, it's considered a violation of the bodhisattva vow to teach them Madhyamaka, as it could destroy them. Yeah, in the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, Nagarjuna's text, he said, teaching emptiness directly to someone not qualified is like someone with no experience holding a poisonous snake. Okay, the third kind of person, as explained in verses four and five, certain simple ordinary people, when they hear of emptiness, will feel a joy that leaps and surges in their hearts their eyes will fill with tears, the hairs upon their skin stand up. Such people are the vessels for the teaching. They have the seed of wisdom, perfect Buddhahood. The final truth should be revealed to them, in whom ensuing qualities will come to birth. And as Rishi said, this kind of listener, you can teach directly. You do not need to convince them with logic. You don't necessarily need to give them all the foundational teachings. But very few of us, I think, have this kind of reaction when we hear emptiness. So maybe it would be best for us to do all of the above. Yes, aspire to understand and practice non-duality directly. Um, but at the same time, as Rinpoche says, if we're riding a horse, we should always bring a donkey as well, so that if we fall from the horse, at least we have a way of continuing our journey. So for us, this means we should continue to study and challenge our own dualistic views, 
since although we may not be philosophers, we do have a philosophy. We're all fish swimming in water. And secondly, we should all practice the gradual path. Always invest in cultivating wisdom, compassion and mindfulness using all the practices we may have been taught. And despite them being more gradual, seemingly more dualistic, we should never despise them. And don't forget, we can always apply the non-dual view, this mere cognizance, no matter what it is that we're doing. Okay, so let's talk a little more about the two truths. I remember we're working within this dualistic Abrahamic culture. A little hard perhaps to understand non-duality from this place. Be open-minded if you can, and if you can't, at least be aware of the potential effect of language, of the underlying thoughts. And Rishi gave the example of taking some kind of hallucinogenic substance and experiencing that you have a tail. Right? And in Madhyamaka, we talk about two truths, relative truth and ultimate truth. Relative truth is the fact that you experience subjectively that you have a tail. Ultimate truth, you have no tail in reality. I remember in previous weeks, we talked about showing a photograph to the Me'en people now, ultimately, of course, there's no photo. There's just something printed on a piece of paper. But in our relative truth, there is a photograph. In their relative truth, there is no photograph. Yeah. So relative truths are very subjective. They're very individual. They're very impacted by culture. Yeah. Relative truth, there is a tale in your experience. It's what's in the mind of the person who has taken this substance. They feel it, it bothers them. And Buddhists don't deny this relative truth at all. They very much accept that we all have subjective experiences. But the ultimate truth is there is no tale outside our subjective experience. There is no objective or independently existing tale. And in fact, more properly, the ultimate truth isn't even saying that there is no tail. So we don't even speak of the tail, right? The tail neither exists nor doesn't exist. There's no need to deconstruct it because there is none there in reality. Only someone who's taken the substance would even talk about the tail. They'll say, yes, I took the substance, I experienced the tail, the effect of the substance wanes, the effect of the tail, the experience slowly fades. But why a tail, right? There's nothing which would suggest we wouldn't experience having wings or having scaly skin, right? None of these subjective experiences are there in reality. It's just what's brought up with our personal causes and conditions. Um, so, as Rinpoche says, this is the paradox. We have these two truths, right? Seemingly there and not there. And all phenomena are like this. And it's not just something that happens at the individual level, it's also social and conventional, right? Because our reality is shared through language, through culture, based on characteristics like how things persist over time, whether they function and actually do things, and how many people agree, right? what is the consensus? And for example, you could say within the US today, there is a shared relative truth that we should have a president rather than, for example, a king or a dictator. But there's very much not a shared relative truth about whether Trump was a good president, or even if Biden fairly won the election. And as Rashi said, if 51% you know, of a population were to take the substance, then the very nature of our democracy would change. There's a nice story, uh, Khalil Gibran tells it. It's called The Wise King. And once there ruled in the distant city of Wirani, a king who was both mighty and wise, and he was feared for his might and loved for his wisdom. Now in the heart of that city was a well, whose water was cool and crystalline, from which all the inhabitants drank, even the king and his courtiers, for there was no other well. One night when all were asleep, a witch entered the city and poured seven drops of strange liquid into the well and said, from this hour, he who drinks this water shall become mad. Next morning, all the inhabitants, except for the king and his Lord Chamberlain, drank from the well and became mad. 
even as the witch had foretold. And during that day, the people in the narrow streets and in the marketplaces did nothing but whisper to each other, the king is mad. Our king and his Lord Chamberlain have lost their reason. Surely we cannot be ruled by a mad king. We must dethrone him. And that evening, the king ordered a golden goblet to be filled from the well. And when it was brought to him, he drank deeply and he gave it to his Lord Chamberlain to drink. And there was great rejoicing in that distant city of Warani because its king and its Lord Chamberlain had regained their reason. And I'm not suggesting that we should all uh, go mad with the belief in self. But just to say, as Rinpoche said in the past, perhaps if somebody is struggling with the idea that they have a non-existent tale, rather than argue with them, maybe you should say, okay, I understand, you know, let's get you a better tailor. Maybe we can find a way of adjusting your suit to hide the tail. Yeah? Back to this notion of skillful means, the teddy bear. Now, in the um, Prajnaparamita Sutras, and Rinpoche taught specifically on the Vajra Chedika Sutra, also known as the Diamond Cutter Sutra, we say uh, phenomena are like a dream, an illusion, a bubble, a shadow, like dew or a flash of lightning. Thus, we shall perceive them. And this applies to all phenomena. Strawberry, you, me, Buddha, rebirth, all conditioned phenomena. Now, democracy is like a bubble. Free speech, shopping, parenting, insurance policies, all of it. But when we say it's like a dream, it doesn't mean it's random or disordered. No? In a dream, you fall from a cliff and you panic. There's good reason. You know what's going to happen. In a dream, you get excited. You get scared. You get horny. All this happens is relative truth. And it's requiring the right causes and conditions to come together. You know, you're if you want to see an oasis, you need to go to an endless desert. You're not going to see it on Bondi Beach, as Rinpoche said. Now, this idea of it's like a dream or like an illusion, hence the language of it's there and it's not there. Yeah? Because illusions, they're not there in reality, but we experience them subjectively. It has this paradoxical nature. Um, and I think it's, it's nice, it's, it's very much a different way from the classical Western logic of things either there or not there. And just this subtle shift from the or to the and, you go from excluding the middle to allowing the middle, and so that you now have this middle way. We use, we use the word zungjuk, right? The Tibetan word means union. Um, and I think the, the word seems very comprehensible. We can use this language and it may not yet really touch us emotionally, it may not yet really be disrupting our normal worldview. And I think often we misunderstand the word middle to imply some kind of average or compromise, but that's not what it means in Buddhism, right? It means going beyond extremes. Right? So I, I actually really like the word union and I love Rinpoche's way of saying there and not there because you realize it's not some kind of compromise, it's the union of seeming opposites, right? It's paradox. Now, this idea of illusion or virtual reality, I just want to spend a moment here, because we might think we're just using some example, but actually it's not relevant to how our minds function. Um, but that's not actually what we know from you know, modern physiology, modern cognitive science at all. There's uh, Stanislas de Hen, he writes in his book, Consciousness and the Brain. He says, we never see the world as our retina sees it. In fact, it would be a pretty horrible sight. A highly distorted set of light and dark pixels blown up towards the center of the retina, masked by blood vessels, with a massive hole at the location of our blind spot, where cables leave for the brain. The images would constantly blur and change as our gaze moved around. But what we see instead is a three-dimensional scene, corrected for retinal defects, mended at the blind spot, 
stabilized for our eye and head movements, and massively reinterpreted based on our previous experience of similar visual scenes. All these operations unfold unconsciously, although many of them are so complicated that they resist computer modeling. For instance, our visual system detects the presence of shadows in the image and removes them. At a glance, our brain unconsciously infers the sources of lights and deduces the shape, opacity, reflectance, and luminance of objects. Yeah, so, you know, we might think it's just some Buddhist example, but far from it. Yeah, and actually, I would say this is one other thing that's quite exciting about modern science, because the more we learn about how our brains function, the more we realize everything in our experience is actually a virtual reality. It's a construction. It is, in a very real way, an illusion. Now, even the eye itself. And we used to think in the Middle Ages that the light came in through the eyes and the lens and somehow landed on cells at the back of the eye and went to the brain. But now we realize that something like 90% of the nerves that go to the eye are actually taking information to the eye from the brain rather than the other way around, right? It's not a simple one-way process, like a funnel, where information is funneled into the brain. Actually, the eye is being presented all the time with predictions and hypotheses by the brain of what it thinks should be happening. And the eye is actually doing a lot of work just to test these predictions and decide whether or not they make sense, right? So we have a top-down flow of information, models, predictions, and a bottom-up flow of information, reality. And that then is what allows us to make sense of the world. I want to show um, some some illusions, some classic illusions, just to make the point, right? You may be familiar with these, but um, I think they're quite fun. Okay, so this on the left is a, a famous one, the Kanisa Triangle. Right. If you look, you can see very clearly there's this triangle in the middle of the image. Even though there's nothing there, our brain interprets it as being there. Right. Likewise, the image on the right, it's just a set of straight lines, and yet our brain interprets there as being some bright center to this circle. Um, okay, next. Now on the left, it looks like a sphere with spines. Your, your brain creates this illusion on the right, it's exactly the same forms, just arranged differently on the page. Looks like nothing in particular. Yeah? So this is, again, a very Buddhist idea. This idea we just put these parts together and it creates the illusion of something whole. Yeah? We have all these different parts of the self and it creates the illusion that there is actually a self that is made up of all of these parts. And just like the sphere on the left, it's a very persistent illusion. We can't shake it. Even if we know intellectually there's no sphere there, there it is. Another set, I like these two as well. The left one's called the cafe wall illusion. If you look at that, you'll be convinced the lines are diagonal, right? They appear to be sloping, the horizontal lines. Even though if you were to get your ruler out and actually measure it on the image, they're all perfectly straight. But the way the black and white squares are aligned, our brain can't help but see sloping lines. The one on the right, fascinating also. Um, if you look, you'll see black points. There's actually 12 of them. There's three rows with four in each row. And when you look at it, you can see it, but as you turn your eye away, they disappear. Right? You, they're only there when you look at them. I'll, I'll post all these in the transcript so you can look at them more closely. The one on the left, I do like it. Actually, a few years back, won the Illusion of the Year Award. They're two identical photos of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but the one on the right looks like it's leaning more than the one on the left. They're identical. The image on the right, also lovely. So you see two hearts. The one on the left looks sort of a dark pinkish color. The one on the right is sort of a bright red. 
Actually, if you look, it's an identical color of red, but because what's in the front, whether it's a blue line or a yellow line, we interpret what's behind completely differently. Okay, two more. I'm not even gonna tell you what these are. So if you haven't seen these before, um, I'll leave them up for a little bit. And as I say, I'll post them for you afterwards. And they're both quite wonderful because when you first look at them, you may have no idea. It's like a jumble of light and dark patches. But when you see it, you'll never forget it. And that image then will always be present for you if I show you the image in the future. All right, so this is again, very much how the path works, how the view works, what it means to realize the truth and how if we can understand non-duality, it'll completely transform our current experience. Okay, so we'll come back to that. I just want as a brief interlude to just uh, give you some more Zen stories just in the spirit of non-duality. So first one on, on wisdom, this is uh, Shuzan's short staff. Uh, Shuzan held out his short staff and said, if you call this a short staff, you oppose its reality. If you do not call it a short staff, you ignore the fact. Now, what do you wish to call this? Okay, another story, this one's called Muddy Road. And this one's about a yeah, non-dual way of thinking about, you know, doing the right thing, right? Unencumbered by rules. At Tanzan and Ikido were once traveling together down a muddy road. A heavy rain was still falling. Coming round a bend, they met a lovely girl in a silk kimono and sash, unable to cross the intersection. Come on, girl, said Tanzan at once. Lifting her in his arms, he carried her over the mud. Ekido did not speak again until that night when they'd reached a lodging temple. Then he no longer could restrain himself. We monks don't go near females, he told Tanzan, especially not young and lovely ones. It is dangerous. Why did you do that? I left the girl there, Tanzan said. Are you still carrying her? Okay, third, another lovely story on kind of living, you know, without all the ordinary worldly need to look good, be seen as doing the right thing and so forth. It's called, Is That So? The Zen master Hakuin was praised by his neighbors as one living a pure life. A beautiful Japanese girl whose parents owned a food store lived near him. Suddenly, without any warning, her parents discovered she was with child. This made her parents angry. She would not confess who the man was, but after much harassment, at last named Hakuin. In great anger, the parents went to the master. Is that so? Is all he would say. After the child was born, it was brought to Hakuin. By this time, he had lost his reputation, which did not trouble him. But he took very good care of the child. He obtained milk from his neighbors and everything else the little one needed. A year later, the girl mother could stand it no longer. She told her parents the truth that the real father of the child was a young man who worked in the fish market. The mother and the father of the girl at once went to Hakuin to ask his forgiveness, to apologize at length and to get the child back again. Hakuin was willing. In yielding the child, all he said was, is that so? Yeah, so again, these have a bit of the flavor of non-duality. So I just want, you know, want to have that maybe seeping in for us. So let's talk a little bit about meditation. All right, and we've said already, all practices aim to realize the truth, but in some cases, the path is more direct than others, right? The signposts are more clearly laid out, the directions are clearer, and there's much more contrast. And remember, meditation means bhavana, right? Familiarization. It doesn't necessarily mean sitting. It means becoming more familiar with the truth so that it is available to us when we need it, right? So for example, you know, we might know intellectually that smoking is bad, but still smoke. We might know intellectually too much time on social media is not good, but we still do it. 
Right? We might know intellectually we need to exercise more, but we don't do it. Right? So just knowing something is not the same as having it available to us in a way that guides our action. And in the Western um, again, psychology and leadership tradition, especially the work of Chris Argyris and Donald Schoen, so Argyris was a professor at Harvard Business School and Donald Schoen a professor at MIT, and they came up with this lovely idea of an espoused theory as opposed to a theory in use. Right? We all have views or mental models, and the espoused theory is the one that we like to think is guiding our action. Indeed, maybe we have accepted it intellectually, maybe we believe it is the right way to live, but when it comes down to our action, what's actually behind it is our theory in use. Right? If we were able to ask ourselves, right, we say we think exercise is important, but we don't exercise, right? so what is the actual theory that is in use, that explains why we don't exercise? And there, if we were to unpack it, we would find the reasons, right? And of course, our effectiveness is the extent to which our theory in use matches what we say we believe, right? Our espoused theory. And the point of practice then is to align our espoused theory and our theory in use. In fact, you could also say this is a way of talking about authenticity. Yeah, it's the whole point of bhavana, of familiarization. And of course, especially it's necessary when we're under pressure, under stress, under duress. Right, that Bruce Lee quote again. Under duress, we do not rise to our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And so the degree to which we need our path to be clear obviously depends on our level of practice. How familiar are we with distinctions of the path already? But also the nature of the environment, right? If our environment is very complicated, very noisy, we might need a much more high contrast teaching to grab and hold our attention. So, you know, in general, the, the Theravada teachings make these distinctions much more clear, right? If you look at the original Buddha's teaching on the Eightfold Path, it talks about right view, right resolve, right speech, right conduct, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right samadhi. Right? In each of these, there's a very clear distinction made between right and wrong to help guide us, to help direct us. Yeah? Learning anything new, we need these clear distinctions. And it might seem then that the Eightfold Noble Path is going against non-duality because we just said earlier, as the Heart Sutra says, right, there's no right, there's no wrong. We've deconstructed these notions. But you can't get there in one jump, right? You need a path of first deconstructing the wrong views, building up the right views, really internalizing them, building up the skillful means, the behaviors, the habits, the ways of thinking, the ways of acting. And only then can you go beyond the right view to not having a view, yeah? Because if you try and go straight from wrong view to no view, right, this non-dual view, you'll just end up doing nothing, right? If all you do is attempt to sit just watching the mind and you don't know how to do that, you'll just end up daydreaming, yeah? So even though we want to end up with a non-dual view, with a non-dual meditation, with non-dual action, our path to get there has to be dualistic. And this, I think, is sometimes part of the complication with the path because we get confused about how can we understand a dualistic or seemingly a dualistic path leading to a non-dual result. I hope you understand that. I mean, even last week, right, we, we talked about the four satipatthanas, right, with Vipassana practice and the Satipatthana Sutta, and how that enables us to realize the three marks, anicca, dukkha, anatta. And even the most basic satipatthana, right, the mindfulness of body, uh, there's one element we didn't talk about um, last week, and one of you brought this up actually in your comments, and thank you. And interestingly, this is also an element you'll very rarely receive in the modern Western mindfulness teachings, but it's actually part of mindfulness of the body. It's the channel ground meditation, right? So let me read. Furthermore, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a channel ground, one day, two days, three days dead, bloated, livid and festering, 
he applies it to this very body. This body too, such is its nature, such is its future, such its unavoidable fate. Or again, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a charnel ground, picked at by crows, vultures and hawks, or by dogs, hyenas and various other creatures, a skeleton smeared with flesh and blood, connected with tendons, bones detached from their tendons, scattered in all directions. Here a hand bone, there a foot bone, here a shin bone, there a thigh bone, here a hip bone, there a back bone, here a rib, there a breast bone, here a shoulder bone, there a neck bone, here a jaw bone, there a tooth, here a skull. The bones whitened, somewhat like the colour of shells, piled up, more than a year old, decomposed into a powder. He applies it to this very body, this body too. Such is its nature, such its future, such its unavoidable fate. Well, so this, this is basic vipassana. Right? This is basic satipatthana. This is the foundation sutra that all the Western mindfulness traditions teach. And of course, it's a very clear, a very direct way of contemplating impermanence. You know, we could say it's very high contrast. We're not going to miss the point in this meditation. Now, I think you know, it's not taught very often, maybe because we're a little worried it's a little too unpleasant for people. It's a very great shame. Yes, okay, maybe mindfulness of breathing is more soothing, more palatable. And of course, if we do it correctly, it will equally help us realize the truth of impermanence. But already, it is lower contrast. Yes, if we look and we see correctly, we will see impermanence of the body just as we would with the channel ground meditations. But with mindfulness of breathing, it's much easier to miss this impermanence, much easier to get caught in just relaxing and calming and soothing, yeah? So you can see, yes, less direct, less contrast, perhaps somewhat higher of a path, but also more dangerous. You know, we're not quite yet at poisonous medicine, but we're heading in that direction. And of course, by the time, you know, we just follow, just know what is happening this very moment, a much higher view, much higher practice, if we do it, yes, we will see impermanence, but so easy just to get lost. And I think that the challenge, right, with meditation is going from the intellectual and conceptual understanding, this vague idea we talked about last week, to something internalized and available to us. I mean, another example is non-attachment. I think intellectually we might all get it, but how do we respond when we lose something precious to us? Another Zen story I love, this one's called Time to Die. Ikkyu, the Zen master, was very clever even as a boy. His teacher had a precious teacup, a rare antique. Ikkyu happened to break this cup and was greatly perplexed. Hearing the footsteps of his teacher, he held the pieces of the cup beside him. When the master appeared, Ikkyu asked, why do people have to die? This is natural, explained the older man. Everything has to die and has just so long to live. Ikkyu, producing the shattered cup, added, it was time for your cup to die. Okay, so let's talk a little about action. Now, we've already said, um, even in the teachings, we'll see this contradiction, right? Even in the basic teachings, the Shravakayana, places like Thailand and Sri Lanka, where the Theravada is taught, monks learn non-self, they learn anatta, and yet they're crazy about conduct, ethics, discipline, robes, merit, begging alms, or in the Mahayana, right? We, we learn non-self, we learn the emptiness, and yet we also talk about Buddha nature and its qualities. And I, I think the danger, of course, is many people get confused. They forget this non-self because they're so focused on the conduct, the ethics, even the qualities of the Buddha nature, right? Can you see these contradictions? Well, Buddha nature may be there, but it's also emptiness. I think very hard for understand, us to understand that word emotionally. Right? Even if we understand intellectually, it's not internalized yet. And we talked about, 
you know, the great diversity also when it comes to discipline. Right? Rinpoche talked about how some monks and nuns can shave their heads, whereas others are yogis who keep every lock. They see them as dakinis, as mandalas. Some keep their smelly dreadlocks for their entire life. I found this photo I wanted to show you. Um, now that one on the left I do love, right? That's um, by a photographer I love called Joey L. And that's a sadhu by the Ganges. And just look at his hair. Yeah, the one on the right is a nun in Ladakh. I just love the photo also. Just that contrast. And, and I think what's so interesting, right? These are both completely authentic forms of practice, right? I mean, in Buddhism, we can't say that one is right and one is wrong. And I think this is behind so much of the confusion, especially for newcomers. Right? How, what on earth is Buddhism where both of these things, seemingly so different, are allowed? Right? And likewise in the practice lineages, as we said. You know, this non-dual view permeates Buddhist culture, lifestyle, symbolism. We have Another set of images I found. Yeah, so on the left, you have monks like Shariputra. Right? Serene, simple, renunciant, ascetic, begging bone, bare, bare feet. In the middle, Avalokiteshvara, right? bodhisattvas. Or Vimalakirti, right? wealthy, earrings, nose rings, adorned with fine, rich garments, jewels, anklets. As Rishi said in the 21st century, this might be somebody with gold teeth and a limousine. Now yeah, on the right, the tantric path, Mahasiddhas, like Saraha, or the arrow-making Dakini. Yeah. And our Rupesh's lineage venerates the wanderer, the Herika, whereas worldly society would see them as bums. Yeah. So these three seemingly contradict, especially if you're looking for simple ethical guidance on the right way to live. How can there be a right way when these ways are so different? Yeah, but for those who appreciate this culture of non-duality, it all fits. Yeah, and why is it accepted? Well, because of the view. It's there, it's not there. The union of emptiness and appearance. Remember, any practice that has the view and leads you closer to the truth is a path. It is a skillful means. And yes, it depends, right, how much we need, right? For monks, there are... 227 vows and lots and lots of discipline, how to behave, all manner of action. I found a, a translation of the Buddhist monastic code online by Tanisaru Bhikkhu. It has two volumes and 1,492 pages, right? That's a lot of detail on right action and conduct. And for ordinary householders, it's already much higher level. We talk about do no harm, do good, train your mind. But it's much harder now, right? Needs much more interpretation. And when you get to the highest path, the non-dual path, you're now told that action is spontaneous action, non-doing, free from dualistic thought, uncontrived, unfabricated. Right in Dujan Rinpoche's Calling the Lama, he says, now clinging to style and manner is destroyed with crazy abandon. Let this life be spent in this state of uninhibited, naked ease. But just note how far that is from the state of the beginner. I mean, you could give me a trumpet to play and tell me to be spontaneous. I don't think it's going to be very pretty. Yeah? I could probably barely make a note. Right? You give that same trumpet to Miles Davis, something very different happens when you ask him to be spontaneous. Yeah? So really making the point, let's not delude ourselves about our ability to engage in spontaneous action, right? Like Miles Davis playing the trumpet, right? Like mastery in any field, spontaneity requires a great deal of practice of mastering the technique, the skillful means, the mindsets, the discipline. As a lovely example, the story of Cook Ting, actually from the Zhongzi, the Taoist text. Cook Ting was cutting up an ox for Lord Wenhui. At every touch of his hand, every heave of his shoulder, every move of his feet, every thrust of his knee, zip, zoop, 
he slithered the knife along with the zing and all was in perfect rhythm, as though he were performing the dance of the Mulgary Grove or keeping time to the Ching Shu music. Ah, this is marvellous, said Lord Wenhui. Imagine skill reaching such heights. Kuk Ting laid down his knife and replied, What I care about is the way which goes beyond skill. When I first began cutting up oxen, all I could see was the ox itself. After three years, I no longer saw the whole ox. And now I go at it by spirit and don't look with my eyes. Perception and understanding have come to a stop, and the spirit moves where it wants. I go along with the natural makeup, strike in the big hollows, guide the knife through the big openings, and follow things as they are. So I never touch the smallest ligament or tendon, much less a main joint. A good cook changes his knife once a year because he cuts. A mediocre cook changes his knife once a month because he hacks. I've had this knife of mine for 19 years, and I've cut up thousands of oxen with it, and yet the blade is as good as though it had just come from the grindstone. There are spaces between the joints, and the blade of my knife has really no thickness. If you insert what has no thickness into such spaces, then there's plenty of room, more than enough for the blade to play about it. That's why after 19 years the blade of my knife is still as good as when it first came from the grindstone. Yeah, so spontaneous action. Yeah, so for most of us, of course, our ability to be spontaneous is limited by our habits, our skillful means, our training. We can only be spontaneous if we know how to do something. Without technical mastery of our instrument, of our Buddhist practice, our spontaneity will be limited. And I think it's also our view, right? Many of us have a very limited idea of what spontaneous means. I think we associate it with being free and wild and countercultural. Maybe hippies or artists or rock musicians after playing a concert. Long hair, undisciplined, lots of sex and drugs and alcohol. Right? We can't imagine spontaneity within the form of discipline, right? How to be elegant and outrageous together, as Rinpoche puts it. So, okay, what about non-duality with the result? Well, I think in the lower path, samsara and nirvana are presented as two very different things, right? They're clearly distinguished and demarcated. But by the Mahayana, right, by the Heart Sutra, as we saw, suffering and nirvana are no different. No suffering, no origin of suffering. And as we saw in week three, Nagarjuna says, you know, Lord, you've never said there is liberation by abandoning samsara. You've said the inherent non-existence of samsara is nirvana. And as Rinpoche said, by the time of the higher path, we'll realize mind is self-awareness. It's like a lamp that illuminates itself. If you're new to meditation, you might feel it's one mind looking at another, but keep doing it and the wall between observer and observed will collapse. You'll know there is no object independent of subject. This is non-duality. So that's just a sense of, as we talk about results, what might it mean? Yeah, I just want to um, close by talking a little bit about, Rinpoche gave some lovely teachings on non-duality, on mandala, on Kuntu Zangpo. I just extract a few things from those. Because in you know, mandala is uh, it's very commonplace as symbolism, especially in Vajrayana Buddhism. And he said, it's good to understand it as rim and center together, right? A paradox. In fact, the, the Tibetan word for mandala, kyoko, actually has this connotation of rim or periphery or perimeter and center. And she said, another way you can understand it is order and chaos. And it's when we try to make order out of chaos that we have the cause of suffering. In fact, trying to make or contrive anything, any fabrication, deprives you from spontaneity, from the genuine, from the uncontrived. Now, so in a mandala, you have usually a central deity and then retinue deities in the four directions. But as you're constructing this as a visualization, you start in the center, but then as you move to the east, the east for you is now the center. It's no, the center is no longer the center. Right? Remember she said, likewise, you know, in Hinduism, Kali, Shiva, they keep changing who is the mightiest, right? And you, you learn through the principle of mandala 
that north, east, south, west, they're all just fabrications. Right? It's a visualization of non-duality. As we saw before, right, and it's not just then the going beyond direction in this manner. Right? It really is, as Nagarjuna taught, it's the non-duality of existence and non-existence. Right? I think a lot of the other, even in Western traditions of non-duality, we might say it's going beyond left and right. I think the example was given, what about a river? Right? A, li a river is a process. It's not attachment to a specific thing. Yes, it's a process. It has less self in that sense, but it's not yet the non-duality of existence and non-existence because for most of us, we think there's a river there, right? We have a name. We may come back to it tomorrow and we still see the river. And I think the danger is we might think of ourselves as a process, but still have attachment to that process. So we're not really practicing non-self yet, right? Which is why in Buddhism, non-duality isn't just beyond these outer distinctions of high, low, up, down, left, right, in, out, and so forth, yeah, nor even going beyond ethical distinctions of good and bad. It's really going beyond existence or non-existence. Yeah, so as Rinpoche said, it's there and it's not there. He, he gave a, a story about Varachana and the begging bowl. This is from Dudrun Limpa. And, you know, Varachana Buddha is one of the five Buddha families. It's not like there are actually five Buddhas sitting there somewhere. It refers to the five elements or the five objects of consciousness, right? Form, sound, odor, taste, tactile objects. And form is the object of eye consciousness and so forth. Um, and sounds, for example, would usually be Amitabha Buddha. But for form, it's Varachana Buddha. So anything with form, color, shape, you know, buildings, colors, edges, all Varachana. And in the sutra is explained that Varachana Buddha is sitting there and on his hands there is a begging bowl. And our universe, as Zambu Ling, is inside the begging bowl. In fact, there's countless universes inside the begging bowl. There are 25 lotus branches and among these, on the 13th lotus branch, there is another branch with a lotus flower and many other flowers all joined together. In the center of this lotus flower, that's where you will find our universe, right? Our world, Zambuleng, with the four continents in Mount Meru, plus a hundred thousand other systems, each with their own continents in Mount Meru. And these are the indestructible worlds where thousands of Buddhas come. Right? This world is called the fearless world because the beings who live there have no basis for fear. But then like in many tantric teachings, we talk about how Varachana is so big one lotus is the whole universe, and one of them is our world. And yet, in each pore of Varachana's body is the whole set of universe and all the planets. And yet, Varachana is no bigger to fit the Buddha fields in each pore, and the Buddha field is no smaller. Right? They're not tiny, minute things. So we're talking here about how shape, color, size, they're all so limited. Right? The idea of color, the idea of shape makes you poor. We're stuck with things like white and yellow and green, squares, circles. Whereas Varachana is infinite. Yeah? So when we see these images, right, we may just relate to them as human looking forms, but not to forget they are symbols, right? symbolizing non-duality, just as the mandalas symbolize non-duality. He also taught uh, Kuntu Zangpo, right, a, a Dzogchen prayer, um, where he said, you know, it's not composed, it's actually magic, right? And we destroy magic with our rationality, as we saw earlier. He said, you know, even Japan used to have great poets like Basho and Isa, but now it's losing that. I just wanted to read you a lovely poem from Basho. An ancient pond, a frog jumps in, the splash of water. As Rupesha said, you know, the non-magical world can't appreciate magic, but the magical world knows how to use the magic. He said this beautiful thing. He said, when a beautiful sunrise appears, if an owl doesn't see it because the owls are blinded by the light, what to do? Pray, may we not be owls. Now, so all this is 
symbolized by Kuntuzangpo, the naked blue Buddha. He has no clothes of devotion or compassion, no emotion. And this is a way of symbolizing this cognizance we've talked about. And just, uh, I'd like to read just a little from this prayer. Just, uh, Ho, everything in samsara and nirvana that can possibly appear has a single ground, two paths and two results. The miraculous displays of awareness and unawareness. Through the aspiration prayer of Samantabhadra, may all awaken in a fully perfect manner in the palace of the Dhammadhatu. The ground of all is unconditioned. The self arising in expressible vast spaciousness without the name samsara or nirvana. The awareness of just this is Buddhahood. Unaware, sentient beings wander in samsara. May all beings of the three realms be aware of the reality of the inexpressible ground. I, Samantabhadra, am aware that this very reality of the ground, without causes and conditions, is self-arising within the ground, unaffected by the flaws of outer and inner, superimposition and denial, and untainted by the stains of the darkness of mindlessness. Therefore, self-appearances are not blemished by any flaws. Within self-awareness resting in its seat, there is no fear, even if the threefold existence is destroyed, nor is there attachment to the five sense pleasures. In non-conceptual self-arising mind, neither solid forms nor the five poisons exist. The unceasing dimension of awareness's lucidity is of a single essence and yet displays as five wisdoms. The five original Buddha families spring forth from the maturation of these five wisdoms. Since I am the original Buddha, through my aspiration prayer, may all sentient beings cycling through the three realms recognize the face of self-arising awareness and fully unfold great wisdom. So I won't read all of it. That's just part, just for aspiration. And that, again, that's, an, that's a way of pointing the finger to the moon, right? We can't think about, we can't talk about the non-duality directly. So... We'll use symbols, we use images, we use these very beautiful and poetic expressions. But I also don't want you to feel that it's too profound, right? So I just want to end with um, a couple more Zen stories, which I think have a, a little more lightness to them. So firstly, Joshu's Zen. Joshu began the study of Zen when he was 60 years old and continued until he was 80 when he realized Zen. He taught from the age of 80 until he was 120. A student once asked him, if I haven't anything in my mind, what shall I do? Joshua replied, throw it out. But if I haven't anything, how can I throw it out? Continued the questioner. Well, said Joshua, then carry it out. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not going to give the commentary on each of these, but I'll, I'll leave them with you, right? So that you can just enjoy them and just reflect for yourself on their non-duality. Right. Another one, Tuzan's three pounds. A monk asked Tuzan when he was weighing some flax, what is Buddha? Tuzan said, this flax weighs three pounds. Okay, another one on Samadhi called the real miracle. When Banke was preaching at Ryumon temple, a Shinsu priest who believed in salvation through repetition of the name of Buddha of love was jealous of his large audience and wanted to debate with him. Banke was in the midst of a talk when the priest appeared, but the fellow made such a disturbance that Banke stopped his discourse and asked about the noise. The founder of our sect, boasted the priest, had such miraculous powers that he held up a brush on his hand on one side of the river, his attendant held up a paper on the other bank, and the teacher wrote the holy name of Amida through the air. Can you do such a wonderful thing? Banke replied lightly, Perhaps your fox can perform that trick, but that is not the manner of Zen. My miracle is that when I feel hungry, I eat, and when I feel thirsty, I drink. Okay, one last one. Called Nothing Exists. Yamaoku Teshu, as a young student of Zen, visited one master after another. He called upon Doko no Shokoku. Desiring to show his attainment, he said, the mind, Buddha, and sentient beings, after all, do not exist. The true nature of phenomena is emptiness. There is no realization, no delusion, no sage, no mediocrity, 
There is no giving and nothing to be received. Dokuan, who was smoking quietly, said nothing. Suddenly, he whacked Yamaoka with his bamboo pipe. This made the youth quite angry. If nothing exists, inquired Dokuan, where did this anger come from? So I'll leave you with that. Just as a reminder, yes, please, let's study, let's practice the Heart Sutra, let's read the Prajnaparamuta Sutras, but let's not delude ourselves just that we think by reading the words that we shall understand, right? Otherwise, I think reality may come and hit us just like Dokuan hit Yamaoka. So with that, I wish you a wonderful week. Um, I'll be back in 10 minutes with questions and answers. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all next week.
so uh, welcome back. No questions and answers. Um, it looks like it's going to be quite brief this week because we don't have very many. Um, let me start with a question from Elena. She asked, will clear seeing of the three marks, impermanence, dukkha and anatta, will it lead us to the non-thought samadhi? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, in fact, it'll take you way beyond, you know, to full enlightenment if you keep practicing. Um, question from Tracy, uh, two parts. So one is, I've always had a hard time opening my eyes when meditating. The guidance I received was to crack them open enough to let a bit of light in, but then I end up tensing my eyelids and it becomes impossible to relax. I know the sound advice is just close them then, but I'd like to keep trying. I'm curious because when you meditate in the videos, your eyes are wide open and looking forward. Is that just because you're filming or is that how you meditate? Uh, yeah, so the answer is that is how I meditate. Um, there is a, a difference between the, I mean, very generally, between the northern schools of Buddhism and the southern schools. I would say a lot of the Theravada schools teach either eyes closed or eyes um, half open or looking down a few feet in front. Um, back to what we're talking about you know, today, this notion of how direct or indirect do we want our path to be? Because obviously, if you're looking down or if your eyes are closed, it's much less direct, right? There's much less reality, so to speak, uh, you know, for you to take in. And so as a beginner, when your mind is less trained, you know, less calm, it's much easier to start for many people um, to you know, remove some of the distraction and just focus on uh, awareness with less in your field of awareness. And then uh, you, know, you can add more. Although I think in many of the, you know, the Theravada traditions, they would never add more. They would just always stay the same way, right? Um, and that, you know, that's very much the way it's done, even I think in the Western insight meditation tradition. Uh, the Tibetan tradition isn't like that, right? From the very beginning, you're taught to meditate with your eyes open. And I, I think that makes sense, right? Because the Theravada tradition grew out of a monastic situation um, where your life is monastic, whereas the Tibetan uh, teachings grew out of the Mahayana, which are really much more for householders, for people living in the world. And if you're living in the world, there's not much point closing your eyes, right? We've said this before, because you're going to crash into obstacles, right? So uh, you're taught from the beginning to take in reality as it is, right? And also remember, our objective is not to try uh, and calm our mind per se. Our objective is to see the truth. Now, you don't have to necessarily see the truth of all of it at once. You can take in parts. You can see part of it. Um, so now to answer your question, Tracy, Sorry, yeah, I, I would say um, up to you. I mean, I, I strongly believe, but this is obviously my tradition, my lineage, eyes open allows you to habituate yourself to being mindful in your ordinary life. Whereas if you practice with eyes closed or half closed, you won't develop the physical, emotional, mental associations uh, to respond with mindfulness in ordinary life when your eyes are fully open, right? Because you'll have developed this association that mindfulness is done with eyes half closed or closed. So I think for that reason alone, I think it's much more powerful to practice with your eyes open. Now, I understand that it can be challenging. And so, you know, we may early on in our path, back to the charnel ground and forest glade, we may need more of a forest glade. We may need a simpler environment and that's fine and that's good, right? But I would encourage you to, and maybe, you know, even if you're not practicing all the time with eyes open, you can come at it the other way as you're going through your daily activity from time to time, just to remind yourself to know what is happening right now. You don't have to close your eyes in order to know what is happening. You just have to remember, right? Just remembering the three marks, anicca, dukkha, anatta, right? Impermanence unsatisfactoriness, non-self. You don't need to close your eyes to do that. And remember, meditation above all else is not about a particular posture. It's about familiarizing yourself with the truth. 
Okay, your second question was, um, could you speak a little bit more about the Vajrayana Nindra practice, and especially the Nindra Ga at Siddhartha's intent? Um, when it might be advisable as a next step in the path? And also, as a preliminary practice takes many years, would it be appropriate for practitioners of all ages? Yeah, so I, I think, as we've said before, um, there are 84,000 paths, and you should be guided, at least in the early days, by your sense of connection and inspiration because the most important thing is practice because the more you practice the path will naturally fall apart anyway you'll graduate to higher and different forms of practice and that's normal and that's natural but only if you actually do your practice right and if you don't find your practice inspiring it doesn't matter how high or high no how noble it might be it's not going to help right i'd far rather you pick a practice that might seem you know, less high, but do it a lot because you're going to make a lot of progress that way versus picking some, you know, supposedly wonderful practice that you never do is just not helpful. So that's the preamble. Um, so I, I think a lot comes down to your personal inspiration, what excites you about practice, which practices feel right, which teachers, etc. right? Now, in terms of, you know, how much time do I need? Yeah, I mean, I think to do the Nindra fully and properly, I think um, it, if you're doing it full time in, a, in the context of something like a three-year retreat, you know, practicing eight, ten hours a day, you can do it in six or nine months. Most of us, of course, don't practice, you know, ten hours a day. So if you're doing something more regular, like, you know, half an hour a day, you can imagine that time is going to go up by a factor of, you know, maybe 20. So instead of six months, you're probably looking at 10 years. And that's fine, right? Um, I should also say, by the way, it's not as if when you finish uh, the Nindro, your next practice is something completely different. Far from it. I mean, the Nindro is actually a complete practice in itself, right? It's, and the Rimshi has often said that word a preliminary is very unfortunate because it leads you to think it's a lower path. It's not. It's a complete path to enlightenment. I mean, if you just were to do that for the rest of your life, that in itself already is a complete and very rich practice. And, and don't forget, right, as we talked a moment ago about the horse and the donkey, forget the nindra. I mean, even just doing mindfulness of breathing, if you do that and bring the three marks, if you do that and know what is happening as it is happening, that already is as high a practice as you can get, right? Because again, the practice is not, you know, how high or high low, it's not the form as much as the intention, the attitude, the quality of mind that we bring to whatever it is that we're doing, right? So don't forget that. But if you're interested, then yes, I would encourage you, um, you know, send a note to Siddhartha's Intent, sign up, get going. I mean, I think it's wonderful. I love it. I strongly recommend it. A question from Lydia. Uh, when I follow something closely, knowing it as it appears, there's a point when I disappear completely, but I know that I've disappeared. Is this disappearance another projection, since it's something that I'm aware of? And I would say, as Rupesha said, right, any time you have constructed a thought, a narrative, or a meta-narrative, any way of making sense of, or narrating, or remembering what's going on, that's just another thought, right? So your only job is to know that thought is happening as it is happening. Right? I think for those of us who are more intellectually inclined, it's very easy to start to get into this very sophisticated analysis of what's happening, but that is no longer practicing, you know, knowing what is happening. That's just another more elevated form of distraction. Yeah. So all you have to do is know what is happening as it is happening, including what you're noticing, including the stories you're telling about what you're noticing, including whatever interpretations you might be coming up with. Just know that. The second part of Lydia's question, is there a distinction between the faculty that projects and the faculty that is aware, or is the one that projects also the one that is aware? I'm not sure I can distinguish the two. They seem both to be there all the time. 
and I think I just gave you the quote from Rinpoche, at the beginning they will seem to be separate, and as you practice more and more, the wall between subject and object will collapse. Yeah? Awareness is self-awareness. And if you keep practicing, you will experience and realize that yourself. Okay, question um, from Lucy. She asks, uh, there's Rinpoche taught in Ukraine in 2013, and she gave the link, um, talking about emptiness and non-duality. And there was a question about how mind creates illusion. And he answered, that illusion is itself created when there's subject and object, and that illusion is created by references. So uh, thanks for that, Lucy. Actually, thanks for pointing me to the teaching because I hadn't seen that one. It's really quite lovely. Um, and so he, I'll just paraphrase. He said, you know, the moment the mind has separate subject and object, that's already illusion, right? It doesn't require anything else. Yeah, because remember, illusion is the second we start to tell any story, to impose any dualistic frame onto non-dual experience. And as soon as we talk about subject or object, already we've done that, right? We already have a dualistic framing. So already it's illusion. Yeah. And then Rosh asked the, the person who asked me the question, he said, when did you, you know, first meet me? And the person said a month ago. And he said, well, you know, did I exist for you a year ago? And the person said, well, well, kind of, yes, because I'd already heard about you from a friend a few years back. And Rinpoche said, well, what about you know, a few years before that? And the person said, well, in my illusion, probably no. Rinpoche said, fantastic. That's exactly it, right? There was no phenomenon. You had no references. So in the relative world, there was no illusion of Rinpoche. Right? It's back to taking... The hallucinogenic substance before you take it there is no experience of tail right now Rinpoche went on he said you know how do i taste and of course the person asking the question had no idea and Rinpoche said well you think i taste salty because you taste yourself and you think everyone tastes salty that's how illusion is created right always using references and, and then he said there are a lot of things about me that are not even part of your phenomena yet and you're lucky because of that so um, I, th I think the point here is, um, yeah, so to your question, what does he mean when he talks about references? I think it's this point about illusion. It's the point about conventional truth. It's the point about how we see the photograph, but the men, people just see some flat, they didn't even probably know it's a piece of paper, just some flat material which they sort of scrumple up and taste, right? You only have phenomena when you have a certain set of references to create meaning, to create relative and conventional truth, right? Without the references to see a photograph as a photograph, the men people do not see a photograph. Yeah. So the illusion is only possible when the right references are in place. Otherwise, you don't see it. Yeah. It's back to the example Rinpoche gave of, you know, you need the causes and conditions of the heat in the desert to see the oasis. If you don't have those causes and conditions, you don't get the illusion. It's the same thing, right? Without the right causes and conditions, without the right conceptual, emotional references, we don't have the illusion. We'll go back to the beginning of what we talked about today, which is partly why in the Western world we have all these conceptual frames about ethics, you know, the Abrahamic systems of good and evil, we have all these conceptual frames about truth and logic and rationality. And so it's creating references, it's creating phenomena for us all the time without us even realizing, right? And so that's why it's so challenging for us to really understand and practice non-duality because we have to undo that entire conceptual apparatus. Okay, so that is the end of the questions. Can I wait a moment? Does anyone else have anything else they'd like to ask? Okay, no. So, um, once again, thank you, and I wish you a good week, and look forward to seeing you next week.